This is going to get me into a lot of trouble. And by trouble, I mean it's probably going to get me a lot of people who don't listen to a video, listen to about the first two minutes, write a comment, and then go away going, yeah, I told him. Because, I'm going to open by saying, it was not te a terrible aircraft. I know the reputation it's got. I know all the quotes that can be found. You have enough people doing enough things, you can get a lot of quotes. You can get a real lot of quotes. And then you can pick from those quotes which ones you like. But, for the very same reason it wasn't a terrible aircraft, it's not a great aircraft. And that's its biggest trouble, because it is flying alongside greats. And so the bar for being even a good aircraft is raised. For being a great aircraft is high, and they're exceeding it. And then there's this aircraft which is adequate, which meets its specifications and requirements, which does its job in a workmanlike fashion. And because it's not up there, it's treated like it's all the way down there. And it's not. The Curtis SB-2C Helldiver, or A-25 Shrike if you're the US Army Air Corps, because you can... We like to joke about the IJN and the uh, IJA, but honestly, between the US Army Air Corps and the US Navy, there is a similar level of relationship, honestly. They're not quite killing each other, but... Well, who am, I, who am I kidding? They're, they're trying to kill each other in bar fights on a semi-regular basis, but they're not aiming to do it as an actually organised, planned, premeditated thing. It's just they're in bars, getting drunk, and decide they're going to become very tribal. Very, very tribal. The Helldiver, though, is a perfectly adequate aircraft. And yes, it has teething troubles when it enters service. Show me an aircraft which doesn't have teething issues when it enters service. Show me an aircraft which has a specification which is written in 1937, 38, which is first flown in 1939, when not just its predecessor, but its predecessor's predecessor are still in production which has a long, slow development where everyone keeps having bright ideas. And then it enters service. And it's got issues. It's got a light frame. It's got some problems. But honestly, it can still do the job. I mean, I'm seriously surprised this thing got off the ground, given the circumstances around it. I think it and Curtis deserve a round of applause for not collectively strangling the U.S. Navy and the Bureau of Aeronautics on several occasions. I also think that, frankly, Curtis kind of fudged things when they were making the bid for it. All these things are true. Yet still, the aircraft that enters service meets the specifications and requirements of the aircraft that was set, of the aircraft that was set. It's just the world has moved on a lot between 1937 and 1942. The world has moved on a lot, a lot. 1937 was when the specifications were being written and developed. 1938 is when they're released. 1939 is when the aircraft is first test flown. 1942 is when it enters service. Whew. A lot happens in that time period. I think we can all agree a lot happens in that time period. And realistically, if you wanted a great aircraft, you should probably have shut it down and started a new aircraft which was going to change which was going to fit with the new times but they didn't because it was an adequate good aircraft adequate to good or rather adequately good it wasn't good but it was adequately good aircraft that met the specifications But it now has a reputation, it does have, of being, 
Well, pretty much every issue it has, every single issue, every single nitpick that anyone ever came up with about it, and some are serious things and some are literally nitpicks, Early prognosis of the beast was unfavourable, as some were calling it. It was disliked, and this is characterised by many, due to its size, weight and reduced range compared to the SPD it replaced. Well, guess what? The specification was for higher speed, and for that they were prepared to accept reduced range. Is that the aircraft's fault? Does it make it a terrible aircraft because it's got reduced range? Usually we have comparisons like, well, you can get fighters at this point which can carry similar bomb loads, but they can't carry those bomb loads for the same range as a hell diver. So yes, you're right, but still the hell diver can carry that full bomb load a lot further. Because that's what it's supposed to do, and that's what it's designed to do. But honestly, its whole program starts a lot earlier, and that's what this video is going to get into. This video is as much about the origin story of the Helldiver and where it comes from, the SB2C Helldiver, to be precise. It's not the only Helldiver produced by Curtis, and that's a bit of a foreshadowing of the story to come. And why it stays in service long after World War II is over. Because it does. A lot of those great aircraft, which completely overshadow it, are long from the world of service and active duty. And hell divers are still plodding along, doing their job. There are various reasons for that, but it's certainly not because it's a terrible aircraft and they want to keep it around because they like having terrible aircraft. Certainly not that. Shameless book plug. I do so like to do these. And frankly, it deserves it. It's a good book. I like it. I'm looking forward to having more out and there will be more out. I promise by Christmas I will have managed to find the money and the time to finish off the other books. Who knows, finally they might have worked through the various rulings about the pricings to things like the Imperial War Museum and the pictures might have reduced in price. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. But yeah, Thank you to everyone for their support and thank you to everyone who's bought a copy of this. Thank you. It really does mean a lot. So, this is what it replaced. The Douglas Dauntless. Slow but deadly. Love for its range. Love for its comfort of flying. And an aircraft which is famed because of its successes during the war. It was there in time for the big battles. It took part in the big battles. Helldivers didn't get their co uh, their combat debut until the 11th of November 1943. They missed out on the major battles of 1942. So the Dauntless gets these moments of glory. They get Coral Sea. They get Midway. They get to stand tall upon mountains of triumph and stare down at everyone else. And that, that luster of glory, that that shine. Well, it creates an even larger mountain for us, any successor to have to climb. It really does. Because it means this aircraft, this next aircraft, has to live up to the image of this aircraft. And the image in the hearts, especially the pilots, is magnified by their pride in this aircraft. And what it achieved. But the thing was. The Helldiver wasn't really a replacement for the Dauntless. That's a mistake. Just because it comes after. And it is supposed to replace in service. Doesn't mean it's the replacement for the Dauntless. Because the Dauntless wasn't even the replacement of the aircraft that flew before it. 
The aircraft that flew before it was the aircraft which set the tone and set the standard for which the US Navy would develop its dive bombers. That was the Curtis SBC Helldiver. Yes, this, this is the aircraft which the SB2C is really to replace. Now, most of you will know I have a lovely book called British Aircraft Specifications. It's a wonderful book, which has all the British aircraft specifications in it. I have for many years been trying to find such a complete single source guide to the US Naval issued design specifications, let alone the Air Force one, well, the Army Air Corps and then the Air Force ones. So far, I can find very decent books for post-1945. Pre-1945, it's more fun. But still, I can say with absolute certainty that this aircraft, this one, came about due to design specification number 113, which was issued in 1931, at a time of remarkable controversy in the Bureau of Aeronautics. Mainly, they were having controversy as to whether or not they would have two-seater fireplanes, monoplanes, or biplanes, and retractable undercarriages, and whether or not the retractable undercarriages were a desirable thing for aircraft carrier operations, because of their fragility. Things which we take for granted now, at the time, were contentious issues. And when I say contentious issues, I am talking full-on arguments. Full-on debates. Now... This made things interesting from the very beginning, but they produced the specification. Seven companies submitted proposals. Two, Douglas and Chance Vought, were given contracts for prototypes. Both of those aircraft were two-seater biplanes. The Navy selects the Curtis one. And from that point onwards, you have a Curtis... Douglas, Curtis, Douglas, pattern established for the U.S. Navy's dive bombers. And to, what, to an extent, what that means is, whilst the Curtis aircraft comes after, comes before the Douglas aircraft, the Douglas aircraft doesn't actually necessarily replace the Curtis in service. For example... The last of the U.S. Marine Corps Curtises were still being used over Samoa in 1943. The U.S. Navy was flying them from these little carriers called the USS Hornet in 1942. Okay. So it's very difficult to say, well, you know what? The SBC was replaced by the, uh, by the Dauntless. It was replaced by the SBD. You can't really say that. Because whilst in theory it was... It's also, in theory, it was. In practice, the Helldiver was still very much around, going, Look at me, I'm pretty. And I fly very nicely. And does a very good job of it. And so when we're talking about the SB2C Helldiver, what you are realistically dealing with in terms of specifications when it comes through and is issued... And I'm going to get into the Ed Hyman comment because that's probably one of the most interesting comments you can have on the on the Hell Diver and how he phrases it. Pretty much, the game is rigged because what the Bureau of Aeronautics are looking for is this is a wonderful aircraft which has done really well and allowed them to develop all their doctrine. What they want is an updated version of this, which is a monoplane and faster. That's what they're looking for. So comparing the Helldiver 2C with the door with the with its predecessor, the Dauntless, is wrong in many ways in terms of predecessor in procurement. You need to compare it with its predecessor in existence, which is the Hell Diver C variant. In fact, you couldn't make it more plain in some regards than the fact that this is the SBC Hell Diver, and 
the uh, other hell diver we're talking about in today's video is the SB2C hell diver. And that changes your approach to evaluating the aircraft. Because really you have to compare it not to the Dauntless, but to the SBC Helldiver. I'd also add something else. This is where we're going to start getting into the factual quotient. Now, I have a lovely book in front of me. It's called... United States Navy Aircraft Since 1911 by Swamber and Bows. It's a rather interesting book. It's a rather good one. It was published by Putnam Press in London. And it was published in 1968. This edition was published in 1976, though. And if in doubt, I've used it as the basis of all the information in terms of aircraft statistics in here. Why? So I have a standardized form. There is also an advantage because this book has a habit of giving me every variance in terms of its operation, every variance capabilities. So I can compare like and time compa uh, compatible with like and time compatible. For example, if I compare the ranges of the SBD-5 for the uh, Dauntless, which is here, it gives me a range of 1,100 straight miles. Pretty good. If I then look at the uh, data, this is for the SB-2C-4, the most numerous version produced of the Helldiver. It gives me a range of 1,165 straight miles with a 1,000 pound bomb load. Well, I suppose 65 miles more is... It's still more. It's not shorter ranged. Oh my lord, is this the first factual revelation of this entire video? Again, when they're saying it's short ranged compared to the Dauntless. They're right. But they're right in so much as they want something which is a lot longer range than the Dauntless was. They want to have that range, that strike capability, because now fighters are getting up to that, and all these things, and they feel the strike aircraft should be a longer ranged aircraft than it is. But the trouble is, it wasn't specified to be a longer ranged aircraft. And very much, they live up to their specifications. I'd also argue that, honestly, when you look through the comparisons on details, maximum speed for Dauntless, 245 miles per hour at 15,800 feet, 144 miles per hour cruising speed, an initial climb of 1,190 feet per minute, and compare that to the Helldiver, the 2C, for Helldiver, well, that has a maximum speed of 295 miles per hour at 16,700 feet. A cruising speed of 158 miles per hour. An initial climb of 1,800 feet a minute, which is very nice. And a service ceiling of 29,100 feet. Honestly... They aren't that great in improvements, but they are improvements. They're not enough when compared to the improvements of the other aircraft going on around them. But a point I'm making already is that what really matters is how it compares in terms of the SBC. And if we compare it to that, well, then it's a massive improvement because the range of the SBC was 405 miles. The cruising speed of the SBC was 175 miles per hour. The service ceiling of the SBC was 24,000 feet. And the rate of climb was 1,630 feet a minute, which is actually, just double checking before I say it, better than the Dauntless's was. 
might explain how the, again, most numerous version of the SBC Helldiver, the SBC-4, stayed around in service for quite so much uh, such time. And its maximum speed was 234 miles per hour. The point is this. We're going to get through and cover the story and the history of this aircraft. We are. We're going to go through its service. We're going to go through some of its trials and tribulations. But I first wanted to clear up any misunderstandings about it on a technical level in terms of its performance capabilities. And I will admit, whilst the SB... 2C4 is the most commonly produced variant. There are also roughly 1100 SB 2C3s, which had a 1900 horsepower engine, really nicely re engined to it. And there was the original SB C2 SB 2C1, which had a 1700 horsepower engine. Um. The SB-2C-1C, of which 778 were built and they first were first to see combat. But, and there's also the SB-2C-2, which is 287 cancelled and not built. Um, it, it's a fun thing. But basically, what we're saying is, there were, of the 1Cs, which had... The lowest powered engine and the closest performance, closest performance to that of a Dauntless. 778 built. They were still an improvement over the SBC. And of the far more numerous later Hell Divers produced, and when I say far more numerous, we are talking roughly 4,000 to the roughly 1,000 earlier aircraft. Their capabilities are far better. But as we've discussed before on this channel, first impressions can be defining. If they're defining for the Albacore, which was actually a decent-ish aircraft, as again, I've discussed on this channel. I think I've done the Albacore already. Yes, I did. It was the third aircraft in this series. I could remember recording it, but I wasn't sure if it was a recording a draft version or if it was the actual version. It's always fun. The aircraft gets an air reputation from the performance of its engine when it's first entered service because the Taurus has problems. Once they work out the problems of Taurus, it becomes one of the most reliable aircraft available and it actually has a longer strike range than the Nakajima B5N, the Kate. It actually has a longer strike range. But if you put pictures of the two next to each other and have people talk about them, most people think the B5N was the out-and-out -out winner. And probably in daylight it is. But in Night Strike, the Albacore is probably going to win, thanks to range and Night Strike capabilities. And it's the same with the Helldiver. The Helldiver develops a reputation based on the issues of the early variants. Those early variants are still useful enough, still valuable enough, still viable enough, though, that instead of cutting it, instead of cancelling it, and let's be honest, this is the same Bureau of Aeronautics which has no qualms with blaming everything on an aircraft if it will, it will save its own skin. It blames the Devastator for the poor performance of the Mark 13 torpedoes. It blames all sorts of things on aircraft types when it wants to, to push the blame away. This organisation still sees this as valuable enough that it keeps in service 
and it grows it and they get an improved variation into service. That's the reality of what we're talking about today. The Helldiver as an aircraft. And in that sense, I thought it would be sensible to give you this quote, or rather, this passage. And it, the picture looks better on the phone, I have to admit, and on the PowerPoint slide than it necessarily does look on this screen now. Oh, helpful when it does that, but I'm going to expand it out, so hopefully that makes it easier for everyone to read. The Curtis Wright Company won a competition to build what was proposed as a successor to the SBD. Uh, not quite correct, Ed, but we'll accept it. Your book's excellent, and I'll show you the book this came from in a second. A dual winner of the competition was the Brewster Company. Poor Brewster. Their SB2C Helldiver was slated to pick up the gauntlet and press the ultimate attack against the Japanese, and hopefully hasten an end to the uh, an end to the hostilities. It was a fine airplane in many respects, but no great improvement over the Dauntless, at least to my way of thinking. The Helldiver was heavier and more expensive than the Dauntless. I was particularly annoyed over Curtis's promise to deliver an aircraft which would weigh 1,200 pounds less than the one we proposed. As it turned out, the Helldiver was overweight by that same amount. Attack plane design, tra t design trends at the time featured a low wing internal and some external weapon surge, single radial engines and multi-place crew stations to accommodate some form of rear defensive armament system, like that of the rear gunner in an SBD. In 1941, in El Segundo, we were pumping out the Dauntless along with the R3Ds. In the preceding two years, our personnel strength had risen sharply from about 700 people at the beginning of 1939 to more than 4,000 in the summer of 1941. Of those 4,000, we had about 500 engineers, most of whom worked in a large open building with only a few partitions between drafting tables. We were humming. Now, I have to admit, I gave you the third paragraph because I didn't want to have someone comment below Ah, you're just cherry-picking his comments. Ed Hyman, this gentleman, was chief designer for Douglas, their competition. If it was a truly terrible aircraft, the guy who literally considered their competition, his baby, would be the person who would stick the nastiest, meatiest, strongest knife in. He even develops the next generation of Douglas counterpart in that cycle of aircraft to come, and I'll probably do a video about that at some point. So, there is no one better placed to critique Curtis. I will also testify that this book doesn't exactly hold its punches when he wants to deliver them. In fact, in some places, he's positively tart, which for those who don't speak upper, uh, upper class, upper middle class English, means he has a viper's tongue and is quite prepared to use it. Now, yes, I must admit he is helped by um, Rosario Rosa, who helps him with the, uh, with the writing, but... I'm fairly sure the words are his. So, if Ed Hyman says that about the Helldiver, literally that, page 96 in this book, I don't think it's that bad an aircraft. And I've done all this. I've spent the first half an hour of this video pretty much just trying to build the case so that now when I get into the discussion of the aircraft, its capabilities, and its problems, it did have problems with the first ended service and how it overcame them, hopefully... Everyone who's still watching, if you are still watching me, and I hope a fair number of you are, are going to give it a fair hearing at. Because, as I said at the beginning, and I will say again now, it is not a terrible aircraft. It is not a great aircraft. It is an adequately good aircraft 
built to the specifications that were set to it by a company which did, yes, play a little fast and loose with their tender, but let's be honest, the specifications they are being basically given were build a, mod build a modernized version of the aircraft you're already building for us because we love it. It's our safety comfort zone. And that's what they did. That is exactly what they did. And with that, let's consider the full vitals and specifications of the Curtis SB-2C Helldiver. I'm starting to realize I shouldn't leave my key ships and key aircraft slides in batches of three. The slides currently are, there are 270 slides in this file and, well... Key Aircraft, Series 1, Aircraft 10, Slide 182. <laughs> it's fun. But on a more serious note with the Key Aircraft series, have you been enjoying them? Do you have any suggestions for the aircraft you'd like to see covered in Key Aircraft Series 3? And... That's because I've got the aircraft penned in for key, uh, key Aircraft Series 2, but, you know, have you liked it? Have you liked the discussion so far? I might even get to the Grumman F-14 Tomcat, and there are all sorts of ships I've got planned coming up, including some quite modern ships. Uh, I'm working out how I can do the Type 23 frigates. The modern Type 23 frigates of the Royal Navy without covering any details which could cause trouble. Because I'd like to do the Oliver Hazard Perrys. And those don't make sense if you don't do the other economical like frigate ideas which were going around at the similar times. And that of course includes the Type 23s. So we'll see. But anyway. I digress and apologize for it. But seriously, suggestions for Ski Aircraft Series 3, what aircraft you'd like to see covered, and maybe put some reasons. If there's aircraft you think haven't got or had a, the right attention or suffer from a, how do I put this, misjudgments, put, down, put them in the comments below. Put them down below. I'll go look them up. If I don't already know enough about them, I'll go look them up and try and find books about them and see whether I agree with your assessment. Or, maybe you disagree with it, but I'll explain why in a video. Set of vitals. Crew 2. Length, 36 foot 8 inches. Um, then we have wingspan, 49 foot 9 inches. That's fully extended. Height, 13 foot 2 inches. Wing area, 422 square feet. The airfoil types. Root NASA, well, NACA 23017, and tip NACA 23009. Pretty much respected wing designs, fairly sensible profiles. Empty weight 10,547 pounds. Gross weight, that's mm, pretty much fully loaded. Not quite all up weight, but yeah. 16,616 pounds. Power plant. A single right R2600 20 twin cylinder uh, twin, uh, twin cyclone 14 cylinder air cooled radio piston engine 1900 horsepower. 1900 horsepower. This utilized a four bladed constant speed propeller to give them a maximum speed of 255. 95 miles per hour, that's 256 knots at 16,700 feet. Cruising speed, 158 miles per hour, 137 knots. Combat range, 1,165 miles, that's 1,012 nautical miles, with a 1,000 pound bomb load. So not full load. Not a full load. Armament, two 20mm M2 cannon in the wings, 
2.3 inch Browning machine guns in the rear cockpit, 4.5 inch M2 Browning machine guns, two each in gun pods mounted on underwing hardpoints, optional. You could have those as extra optional weapons. It could carry eight 5 inch high velocity aircraft rockets. Or it could carry bombs in the internal bay, 2,000 pounds of bombs or a Mark 13 torpedo. And underwing hard points, well, that was 500 pounds of bombs each. That's a significant load. That is a significant capability. The more weapons you put in, though, the shorter its range is. Because, again, it needs to use more fuel to stay airborne. It needs to use more power to stay airborne, to generate the required lift. And also, maneuvers and takeoff, etc., become heavier and more difficult the heavier the aircraft is. And by heavier, I mean quite literally that. The controls, everything feels heavier when you're with an aircraft which has more fully loaded. Still, it's a capable aircraft. It's exactly what was required. It's exactly what was specified for in operational abilities. Now, still, it does have issues. Initial issues noted in testing was poor power from its right R2600 twin cyclone engine and the initial three-bladed propeller it was fitted with. Concerns went further to include structural weaknesses because they felt it was built with an old pattern in certain sections, the sections which were actually built to the same pattern as the SBC. Unsurprisingly, there was some handling issues, there was directional instability, and it had bad stall characteristics, and the stalling speed is important when you're landing on a carrier. This is all discussed before 1939. In 1939, they put a model of it into an MIT wind tunnel, and Otto Koppen, one of the professors of aeronautical engineering, is often quoted for this, saying, if they build more than one of these, they are crazy. He considered this due to the issues of the small vertical tail. Not the first point in their development, or the last, where perhaps there was an opportunity to go, why are we developing this? Are we really developing what we need to be developing? Are we really thinking through what we are procuring? Instead, they use it as an opportunity to try and improve things, to try and make things better. And, well, that leads us on through the story of its history. The first prototype flew in 1940. It was tested heavily. And it was tested so heavily it crashed in 1941 when its engine failed on approach. Curtis was then asked to rebuild it. Fuselage was lengthened. Tail was increased in size again. An autopilot was fitted to try and help the poor stability. Some kind of flying assist. This revised prototype flew in 1941, but its wing failed during diving tests in December 1941, and it was destroyed at set again, or rather permanently this time. Despite all this, the Navy had ordered large-scale production to begin in November 1940. We we're talking about an aircraft which doesn't have its proper maiden flight, actual proper to test flight. It's gone through some ground testing till December 1940. So they had ordered production before it even began. Even to be tested. Now you can say, well they have to because otherwise they won't have the aircraft available in time. And that is a logical argument to make. But it's also an argument in reality, they are ordering an improved version of the older SBC. Basically People like to look at the Super Hornet and go, the US Navy's developed a new idea. They haven't. Meet the 
Super Helldiver, realistically. But they just didn't bother to even add the super in front of it. They didn't even bother to do that kind of impression. They just, it's the SB2C Helldiver. No one in Congress noticed, no one in government noticed that we were ordering more of this aircraft, which you, uh, you think is probably the older version. It's actually the newer version. You won't know it's we're just reordering more hell divers. They order large modifications to be done for the production model. The fin and rudder area were again increased. Fuel capacity was increased. Self sealing fuel tanks are added. A very useful feature which the Royal Naval Fl Air Service, the fleet air arm, were really in favour of and had been showing consistently in operations were very useful. And the US naval aviation aiders were um, themselves rather enamoured with self sealing fuel tanks. Great things. The fixed armament was doubled. At this point, to four machine guns, but it would later go up to cannon. And it was built with larger fuel tanks, again, as mentioned, increasing its range. However, the Avenger managed to enter service before the Helldiver because of all these changes. The Avenger had begun its development two years after the Helldiver had. But, with production at Columbus, Ohio, two Canadian factories, including Fairchild Aircraft Limited and Canadian Car Foundry, the Curtis quickly started to churn out models. And a total of 7,140 of the various models would actually be produced during World War II. Now, the thing is, the US Navy still doesn't want them in service and doesn't let them in service immediately. Even after those changes already, they have to have roughly 880 modifications. Now, I question that figure. The reason I question that figure is not because I think it's only 880 modifications. It's because it's too neat. And it's because it doesn't match up with some of the other sources. I do realize the source which gives that is a very, very good work. Uh, in fact, I got this from Aviation History, um, a article by Robert Gutman, which was about the Helldiver, which he calls the last dive bomber, which is an incorrect title. It really is. It's an incorrect title. There are other dive bombers which come after this, yes. Um, even from Curtis. There comes the XSB-3C, and there is from Douglas the uh, BTD Destroyer. Um, they are, don't enter mass production, so I, he, basically he should have that. If that title had been the last he, uh, last dive bomber in service, hang on, the Sky Raider could technically do it. Um, y yeah, th there are problems with that title, but it's a good article. It's a really good article. They're just this is this is why I don't often talk about some of my sources and some of the sources I read in these videos. Because the things that I'm sure they make the titles because they sound cool and they're going to get people to read them. But the historian in me is going, but is that historically accurate? And then I look at my own title from my own book and go... It's arguable, but it is also a stretch in some ways. You can argue against it, and I go, yeah, I can't be can't be one rule for me and another for everyone else. I have to be fair and even. It's a good aircraft. It takes time to become good. It takes time to become the valued member of the U.S. Navy that it's going to be. But with 880 modifications, they get there. And they start off serving on the Bunker Hill. And they take part in the attack on Rabul in November 1943. Now, the first version of the Helldiver, the SB-2C-1, was kept in the United States for training. 
its various problems meant only 200 examples of it were built, and they were kept for training. The first deployment model and deployment version was the SB2C1C. Do you see? Because I see. It's the SB2C1C. Or technically the SB2C-1C. I sound like I'm a lawyer quoting legal code. Sorry. It could deploy slats, mechanically linked with the landing gear actuators, and this meant by extending from the outer third of the wing's leading edge, they provided extra control at low speeds, which was supposed to help it with its stalling issues. It was supposed to provide them, the pilots with more control. It was supposed to provide the pilots with more flexibility. Unfortunately, due to the fact it really wasn't an SBD, and more importantly, it wasn't the souped-up new version of the SP of the SBC, which they'd all loved, or rather enough of the senior officers had loved that it had a reputation. The air crews don't like it. There are quite a few of them who consider its size, weight, and as said, they, they feel like it has a reduced range compared to the SPD. Doesn't actually when you look at the stats, but the thing is, it feels like it does. Especially as it's a more powerful aircraft, so you've loaded up with a similar bomb load. It feels like it gets through fuel quicker. It feels like it does. And in combat, self-image and confidence is everything. Self-image, i.e. how you perceive yourself. What do you perceive yourself as? Do you perceive yourself as a warrior, as a soldier, as a sailor? Do you perceive yourself as an elite? That's even more of you. Do you perceive yourself as an elite of an elite? So this, the whole thing with the Royal Navy for centuries. Why does it have the naval dominance it has when it really doesn't deserve it? Well, because its personnel expect it to have a naval dominance. And so they act like they have the naval dominance, even when they're losing. And that's important. Because that means they're usually around for the winning as well later on. The trouble for pilots is they've just got into the scenarios, they've gone through the battles, they've gone, f they've now got a lot of experience, and they're looking at this aircraft, and it doesn't feel like the evolution for modern combat that it was supposed to be. It feels like old ideas. And it is old ideas. It is. It's not a bad aircraft, it's still useful, it still does us the job, but it's not the aircraft they want to provide the kind of duties and missions they want to do and they were expecting to do with what was marketed as the successor frontline aircraft, which would allow the Devastator and the Dauntless, which would allow the Dauntless, Devastator was replaced by the Avenger. Allow the Dauntless, why are the, the, all the Douglas aircrafties, come on, just help a dyslexic historian out here, would allow the Dauntless to go to secondary roles and provide support that way. Because that's basically what happens. What happens is the new aircraft comes into service, it takes up the primary role, the Older aircraft that it's replacing goes to secondary roles, and the oldest aircraft that the new aircraft is actually replacing finally gets phased out. That's the sort of system the Americans have been running. It also allows them to glow, grow their air force and to uh, maintain uh, a high pitch of capability, because you don't just need capable aircraft, you need crews who are capable in that aircraft. And so what you don't want to do is have a rush changeover. You want to have some balance in the force and the ability to grow that experience organically and develop things and maintain that experience. So what you're doing by having this sort of 
transition and this sort of phased workaround is you're maintaining experience within the four structures. But the trouble is, war has changed the mission set. War has changed the role of the dive bomber. War has changed the role of the scout dive bomber, especially. And this aircraft is all about the perception of what its role would be and what its role was in the late 1930s. Maybe you can be generous and say 1940, but honestly, its roots are in 1937 and 38. And that is a very long time ago in terms of experience of operations. That's an incredibly long time ago. And it's under those circumstances that its wartime service and introduction is really taking place. Now I'll probably skip through this slide rather quickly because I've kind of talked through some of the points I had for this slide. But they made more sense with the previous slide and the previous part of the discussion, so please do bear with me and understand. As you can imagine, because this is the aircraft I'm talking about, the introduction didn't go smoothly. There have been those 880 corrections, and, well, those 880 corrections had all required weight to be added. Adding in all these things changed the aircraft. And, honestly, uh, that's where you get a lot of the ideas of it being slow and underpowered come from, because it's had all those things added on. In fact, there's a... There's a debate over exactly how much the modifications increase the weight, because depending on who you're asking, the Navy will claim that their, their modifications added a mere 30% onto the weight. The um, company said, no, 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 it was closer to 50%. The, where most of the historians came down, it's roughly 42%. And that's the figure you will see most places these days. I think the first person who calculated it was... Um, was it Robert Gutman? It could have been Robert Gutman. Um, but I think someone else might have done it earlier as well. But that's where my, my brain's failing to remember we, uh, uh, the, the one who did. Or at least who was close to it. There was a lot of discussions at the time. And this is one of the reasons why production is slow. There is also some description of manufacturing quality uh, uh, control was poor. It's not so much it's poor as they are making so many changes on the aircraft as they go. And as they've been building, they're stopping, going back, restarting, changing. You're not going to have good quality control under those circumstances. This is all symptomatic, to my mind, of an aircraft program which should either have been cut completely because the world has changed, or left alone and allowed to be an interim aircraft with a successor coming through. Now, I realise that's coming from a Brit who's saying, well, you know, <laughs> Albacore was the interim aircraft until the Barracuda was supposed to show up between that and the Swordfish, and uh, yeah, the, that was the last for a while, and then there's the... Vilmar, which was another interim aircraft. So, yes, I'm coming from the nation which, let's be honest, moved past being the prince, blasted straight through being the, uh, being the queen or king and went to the full-blown god of... Well, it might be interim, but like being fitted for, not with, we will make it work somehow and everyone will consider us weird. That's the British. But still, when you have a situation like this, when you have an aircraft which was basically being procured under one metric, which was not necessarily the right metric to begin with, and you have it coming into service, and you've chopped and changed while it's been in development, you cut it in development, or if you're going to put it in, you put it in and you go, right then, we're going to take a short order as is. And while we're doing that, that's going to cover us until we have something new. Or you extend the Dauntless in service if you're really upset with it. But they're not. I mean, the people who are really upset, and this is, shows you exactly how not quite right it was, was the Royal Navy, who took delivery of some of them and went, we're not using this. 
The Royal Navy, which is grasping for every aircraft it can get its hands on at several points during World War II, which is constantly having to fight with the Royal Air Force over access to British parts to maintain its British-built aircraft, so will literally walk over cut glass. Buck. Naked. To get American aircraft, because it doesn't have to fight over the logistical supply for them. Please note I didn't use the word in the middle of the na of the buck and the naked. Might have thought it. Didn't, uh, didn't use it. And yet... They take one look at this and go... It's a fine aircraft. We don't need an aircraft for this role. We d and this aircraft is not good enough to include alongside the roster of other aircraft... That can also do similar jobs. Yes, it can carry more bombs. Well, roughly the same amount of bombs as the Hellcat and the Corsair a greater distance, which is an advantage. But the British have got the Albacore. The British have got the Barracuda coming along. They've got the Fairy Firefly. They don't need another aircraft to be a bomb truck. They just don't. So they don't go with it. But the Americans do keep with it. And thankfully they do. Because in 1944, with the SB-2C3, they finally get the R-2600 twin cyclone engine, which has 1900 horsepower. And they also get the four-bladed propeller. Those were the stats I gave you earlier. This is when the bulk of the production starts, when the quality control gets a lot better because they are happy with the design, they stand on it, dives on it, they've got enough power for the power to weight ratio for it to work. And these are the aircraft which then take part in the Marianas, which take part in the partially sinking the Mushashi and the Yamato, which take part in Taiwan, in Aojima, in Okinawa which take part in the Ryoko attacks, which take part in the attacks on the Japanese Hogan Islands, the Honshu. These are the aircraft which are doing the patrols, the really critical patrols, between the dropping of the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the official Japanese surrender, and the immediate preoccupation period. These are the aircraft which do all that. But here's the problem. Here's the problem with their wartime service. Here's the problem with their role in the war. As I've already mentioned. The F-6F Hellcat, the, uh, the F-4U Corsair, could carry a similar bomb load. A shorter range, but a similar bomb load. There are rockets now. Why do you need a dive bomber? And those are precision weapons, which allow you to do a far safer maneuver from the aircraft's perspective. During World War II, this provides a lot of the, a lot of assistance and a lot of capability. And honestly, they are good. But you can also point to the Battle of the Philippine Sea, which, as I mentioned earlier, I mentioned the Philippines, but also the Battle of the Philippine Sea, 45 hell divers, which were launched at the most extreme of their range, were lost when they ran out of fuel returning to their carriers. Now... The thing is, these are not the first aircraft to do that. The USN has a habit of trying to go for the longest range it possibly could. And that pushes things. That pushes aircraft, that pushes crew, that pushes everyone, especially under combat circumstances. And sometimes bad things happen. But the problem with all of this, all of these things that happened for this aircraft, is that realistically... You're doing all this, you're justifying all this for a system which people don't want to use. It made huge impacts on its design, its fuselage, its shaping, everything, for it to be a dive bomber. And by the time it's really reaching its peak of service, no one wants a dive bomber. A clue, uh, the clue is in the Royal Navy turning it down. You could not have a Navy which had desired a dive bomber more in 1939 than the Royal Navy. 
They brought the skewer into service as a fighter aircraft because they couldn't get a dive bomber through the air ministry knowing it was an atrocious fighter because it was designed to be an exceptional dive bomber. They knew that. They procured it anyway. They even went through the whole rigmarole of having some of the skewer airframes designed as the rock. A turreted fighter. Because that was what the air ministry advised. And because by agreeing to that, the air ministry took even less notice of the Vickers site, which was being fitted quickly onto the skewer. That is how obsessed the Royal Navy was with getting a dive bomber. And when they are offered this aircraft in 1943, they go, no. Officially, it goes to the airplane armed establishment, experimental establishment, and they say it has appalling handling. And so it's unsatisfactory tests. But you are talking about a nation which took the Corsair, an aircraft which no one believed could land on a carrier and worked out how to make it land on a carrier because they wanted it. If they wanted the Hell Diver, they'd have fixed the Hell Diver if they felt it, it was worthwhile. They didn't want it, so they didn't. But that doesn't make it a bad or terrible aircraft. It really doesn't. And after the war, they kept on serving. After World War II was over, they keep on serving. In the US Navy, well, they are still serving well into 1947, and the reserve aviation units are serving with them till 1950. There was a big thing made of them, of course, also becoming the A-25A Shrike. And 900 aircraft were ordered under that designation by the U.S. Army Air Corps Air Force. It changes its name at certain points. And, well, the trouble for that is, again, what's it going to be used for? By the time it enters service in late 1943, the P-47 Thunderbolt is pretty much doing that operation. The Republican P-47 Thunderbolt, that glorious aircraft, is literally doing the tactical air support missions that the Shrike was supposed to do. So, they transferred a little over 400 of them to the U.S. Marines. U.S. Marines sent some to, well, NGB, to carry out bombing missions on bypass Japanese strong points which were in that area but otherwise they used them for trainers and target tugs because again they like the Royal Navy have Corsairs and they love them and yes they're not a hundred percent solution to the exact mission that the Hellcat was supposed to do Helldiver was supposed to do but um, it was enough it was enough and they also, for those who don't have uh, have Corsairs, they had Hellcats. <sighs> Again, the US, U.S. naming practices really don't help with this lengthening. <laughs> I love them dearly. Hellcats probably my one of my favorite aircraft ever. But yeah, honestly, you have to love the pugnacious Grumman fighters. They're just so pugnacious. But that's an aside. The Australians, well, the Australians, again, a service known for basically taking whatever they could get hold of. Um, but there's a small problem. And really, it's only a tiny problem, but it does become a little bit of an issue with the procurement. Because uh, in 1943, after they received the first ten shrikes, they decide dive bombing is an outmoded tactic. And this is the real problem, as said, for the whole way through for Helldiver's career. It's a dive bomber entering service in a world where dive bombing only made sense for the first couple of years of the war. 
Remember, dive bombing had been coming in as a doctrine about 1917. It had first been tried out in 1916, and there are pilots who are doing similar tactics to dive bombing as early as 1915. But it had started out with experience in World War I. And it was a desired thing for the 1920s and 30s. But the trouble is, by the time you get into World War II, there are about four things working against dive bombing by the time you get to the middle of World War II. One, there's the sheer quantity of anti-aircraft fire. Two, there is radar and there are fighters which are looking for dive bombers because they are quite nice targets. Three, you have developed rockets and other systems which allow you to do these things to an extent from standoff range or in different maneuvers which are far safer for your aircraft and also far easier on the airframe. Dive bombing is incredibly intensive for your airframe and likely to break you. And four, the most important thing of it, dive bombing is something which requires an intense amount of training to do right, especially under the circumstances they were trying to do it. If you don't have, therefore, really train well-trained personnel that you're prepared to throw away in aircraft which might ha might not come back, which probably won't come back, because even if they're not hit by enemy gr ground air defense fire, if they don't pull out at the right time, they can end up plowing into the target themselves. And that is a significant number of dive bombers do that. I know they, there's all sorts of automatic brakes and automatic systems which are supposed to work, but if those systems are not perfectly maintained, or receive any kind of damage, they might not work. The pilot might black out, and you can have all sorts of scenarios. Now, traditionally, the pilot blacks out when they're pulling up because of the G-forces it exerts on the body. But it can actually happen on the way down in bad case scenarios. And this is the problem. This is the problem for them. When they're coming in, you've got a dive bomber coming into service at a point which no one really wants to do dive bombing anymore. However, there are still those who want to use the aircraft. And post-war, the Greeks and the French really loved them. The French used them in the Battle of the Empire in 1954. During the Indochina War, they are used from all their carriers. Uh, during this point. This is a picture of them. The Greeks, well, the Greeks used them along with Supermarine Spitfires and various other aircraft they managed to get hold of, primarily for counterinsurgency tactics in the Greek civil wars against communist forces. Now, this did have changes. The gu rear gunner position and their twin machine guns were deleted because they weren't needed. There's no air-to-air -air opposition. And the Rubber tyre, which was used for carrier landings, was replaced with pneumatic tyre because it was far nicer for rustic landing. But we are talking about an aircraft which, when it went to service with number 336 Squadron, was probably the best, in the view of the Royal Hellenic Air Force at the time, strike aircraft they had available. And they used it particularly in the destruction of military resistance uh, that led up to the ceasefire. They were using it for precision strikes. Again, something which it could do very well. It was very capable under that scenario. So, with that all in mind, let's go to a summary. This was an aircraft which was designed to replace an aircraft, or rather a continuation or evolution of an aircraft, which had set the world on fire in its period as far as the US Navy Bureau of Aeronautics was concerned. The SBC was glorious. It really was. And it was an excellent aircraft for its time. It was an excellent dive bomber. And in the pattern that the US Navy pursued, where they were alternating pretty much between Curtis and Douglas and Curtis and Douglas. 
to produce their front line dive bomber that would then become their second line dive bomber and then new aircraft coming in it fitted the mold the problem is what is it built to to do versus what is it needed to do it's built to be a dive bomber at a point at which dive bombing is no longer the weapon system it was perceived to be. In fact, dive bombing was never the weapon it was perceived to be, but it was it was thought it was going to be really, really useful and really, really critical. Instead, dive bombing had become a nice to have, an extra, but there are other better ways of hitting these targets far safer far better for the aircraft and far easier for the air crew. And yeah, maybe it takes two ro aircraft firing rockets to take out a target rather than one dive bomber dropping a precision bomb. But to get that bomb to hit might require you to send in eight aircraft and you might lose four of them. Whereas to get those two aircraft rockets loads to hit, you may be sending four. Possibly just two. So it has to transition to, for want of a better phrase, a bomb truck. It has to become a strike aircraft that's primarily about the ordnance it carries, not the ordnance and the way it can deploy that ordnance. And that is a very different thing to expect from an airframe. The Grom Avenger does that exceptionally well. It really does. But what's it designed as? It's designed as a torpedo bomber. It can carry that weight already. It's built as that. So yeah, you want it to it needs to take an impressive load of bombs? It can do that. It can deliver them. Furthermore, this aircraft was in many ways designed as an anti-shipping dive bomber as well. And you can see that to an extent in their utility versus Yamato and Mushashi. The, the capabilities they bring to that kind of that particular and get those particular engagements. They're great aircraft for that. But how often is that role used? The fact that we remember those uh, those events, it's not just because those were the largest battleships ever built. And that was their demise. It's also that those events were fairly rare. And that's the other trouble. So they have a party piece they never use. Or pretty much never use. So their capabilities are therefore going to be compared to the aircraft around them. And they are a perfectly, adequately good aircraft for the role they were originally envisaged for perfectly adequately good for the role they were originally envisaged for and the specifications as set but they are not good for the role they find themselves eventually doing honestly the avengers better because what is requires the maneuverability of aircraft you probably would prefer to send a Corsair or a Hellcat to do. And what requires a heavy bomb load, while well, an Avenger can carry a better, bigger bomb load. This sits in the middle. It's neither fish nor fowl. The Helldiver is just not useful enough. And so, when compared to those great aircraft, those great Grumman aircraft and the Fort Corsair, it looks terrible. When you are expecting excellence and exceptionalism as a standard, because this is what these aircraft are certainly perceived to have achieved, and arguably in many ways did achieve, although let's be honest, they all went through their own tribulations. The Corsair was a really mean aircraft to pilots, especially at the beginning. 
Now we think of it as this great aircraft with those sexy gull wings, but honestly, at the beginning, it was far worse to its pilots than the Helldiver was. Far worse. But that's something for a discussion another day. This aircraft was adequately good. And I know I keep asking variations on this question, but it's important for this series. And it's important for me as a naval historian, as someone who seeks by studying history to really learn the lessons of history. And for that, you need to really look at the facts of the case, not necessarily the mythology and the it cut the wider culture impression of something. The question today is, what other aircraft, what other systems do you think have suffered because whilst they were the, they delivered exactly what was asked of them, their counterparts that were the little one alongside them went further and delivered more than was asked for them, and what they were asked for as well and was asked them, no longer fitted what was really needed. I think you'll be surprised when you think about history and think about how many things are viewed as mistakes or bad decisions, bad procurements. Now often it's not the system as default. It's the fact that the procurement service didn't go, do we really need this anymore? That's a question that should probably have been asked with this aircraft. Do we really need this anymore? Is it better to carry more fighters and more Avengers? But a legacy of the SBC was that it was felt to be absolutely essential to have this kind of aircraft in an air group. Because the SBC had been so useful and so important. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. And I said that was the question. So what's coming up next week? Next week is... The first carriers, conversions and scratch builds. I'm going to be having fun with that because some of the stuff the Royal Navy and the other navies were getting up to. Going through Langley, Hosho, Eagle... Hermes, Furious, and some of the other vessels. Ooh, that's going to be fun. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed, and take care.